Loudness equalization or sound normalization is beneficial for two reasons. Number one, it reduces the volume of loud sounds, which can reduce ear damage and prevent you from disturbing your neighbors or other members of, of the household. Number two, it increases the volume of quiet sounds, so you can hear things in noisy environments or if the audio has high dynamic range. Dynamic range is the difference between the highest and lowest volumes of a piece of audio. Sound normalization reduces the dynamic range. This is useful if you want to hear quiet dialogue in a movie and don't have subtitles available. One example of where this has benefited me is when listening to lecture recordings at uni. I often have to turn up the volume to hear the lecturer speaking. And some lecture recordings have a lot of loud static and audio pops, which are much louder than the lecturer's voice. This can be rather painful to listen to. For me, the solution was to enable the loudness equalization feature in Windows sound settings, which has saved my bacon in the past when watching MLG parodies and YTPs. With sound normalization, I don't need to crank up the volume to hear things. I can keep the volume at my usual level or even turn down the volume because Windows sound normalization is rather aggressive. Of course, loudness equalization or sound normalization does have a few downsides. It sounds fine with voices, but music sounds like utter garbage with most sound normalization methods. The dynamic range of music gets compressed and the overall volume of the audio track goes up and down, especially when transitioning between loud and quiet parts of the track, which is rather distracting. Of course, even with music, sound normalization can be good in small amounts. One issue with my music playlist is that audio tracks tend to vary quite a lot in overall volume. Some tracks have very little dynamic range, while some have a lot. And some tracks have a maximum volume well below the zero decibel limit for some reason. If the volume difference between songs ends up bothering you, then this is where sound normalization may come in handy. Windows sound normalization is too aggressive for my tastes and it lacks adjustability. So another sound normalization method is needed. So I personally use AIMP. It has a rather excellent built-in volume normalization feature, which is quite simple to use and is adjustable. The settings I use are this. I keep the minimum preamp at default and reduce the maximum preamp to about five decibels, which is about a three times increase in volume. This keeps all of my music at comfortable listening levels while not significantly affecting the dynamic range of the music. If preserving dynamic range is a concern for you, you may consider replay gain. Replay gain is a commonly used method of volume normalization that aims to keep the overall volume of multiple songs in a playlist constant while preserving dynamic range. Replay gain does not affect the audio itself, it only adds metadata to the file. You can remove any changes by removing the replay gain metadata. You can do this on FUBAR 2000, which doesn't affect the audio itself. Note that replay gain generally works best with playlists or albums. If you add more songs to your playlist and you happen to use replay gain, you'll want to run replay gain again. FUBAR 2000 is a music player that allows you to use replay gain on all of your songs. To do so, you select the songs in your playlist you want to use Replay Gain on and right click. Then select one of these options. Replay Gain works on many other music players, not just FUBAR 2000. I use FUBAR 2000 to apply Replay Gain metadata while I play the songs elsewhere such as on my phone. FUBAR 2000 works pretty well with various file types and remains the easiest method to use Replay Gain in my opinion. MP3 Gain is another tool that can be used to apply replay gain metadata to MP3 files. There are tools that can irreversibly change the track volume. One example that looks promising is Media Monkey. I haven't tested it, but it seems you can normalize volume by right clicking on tracks and clicking level track volume. Note that it only works on MP3 files. So one issue of these volume normalization options for music is you have to apply them every time you add a new song to your playlist. So having to do this every time is a bit annoying. So I personally prefer an on-the-fly solution such as the one found in AIMP, even if dynamic range is compressed somewhat. One example of where loudness normalization can be useful is in films. 
Films tend to have a very high dynamic range, so dialogue can be very quiet compared to the loud parts of the movie. Uh, this can be an issue if you happen to have a lot of background noise in your room, or you don't want to distract your neighbors with loud noises. Reducing the dynamic range of the audio can be quite useful in this case. VLC Media Player has two methods of sound normalization. It has a compressor and a sound normalization option. VLC sound normalization, which is separate to the compressor, lacks customizability and I'm not too sure how it works, so I would probably use the compressor instead. What a compressor actually does is actively compress or reduce volumes that are above a certain threshold. It doesn't do any dynamic amplification, unlike the methods we saw previously. So what settings should be used? Before deciding on what settings should be used, we need to know roughly what these settings actually mean. I looked up a few guides on Google and this is what I found. RMS peak. I'm not too sure what this does, but I think a value of 1 measures only the peak amplitude, while a value of 0 measures the loudness of the whole waveform or something along those lines. It's probably best to leave it at 0 since we're concerned about the overall loudness. That is, how loud it is to the human ear. Attack is how long it takes for the compressor to react after the volume exceeds the threshold amplitude. One of the inherent limitations of compressors or most loudness equalization methods is that if the volume increases very quickly before the attack time is over, for example when an explosion occurs in a movie, you can still get loud volumes. I'd set this anywhere between 20 to 50 milliseconds. In my case, I'll use 20 milliseconds since my ratio is pretty low. Release is how long it takes for the compressor to stop reacting after the volume goes below the threshold. I'd set it around 50 milliseconds. If you have a high compression ratio, you may prefer 300 milliseconds. This should always be more than the attack. Threshold is the volume level reached before the compressor reacts. About minus 10 decibels is around what I'd set it at for most films. Uh, you can increase this to 20 decibels if need be. Ratio is how much the volume is compressed. This, along with the attack and release, determines how aggressive the compressor is. Higher ratios determine how much the volume is compressed by. Most people use this at 20 to 1 ratio. I would not recommend this. I would personally use a ratio of 2 to 1 because I want my dynamic range to be preserved somewhat. 20 to 1 just sounds like crap but I can see why people may prefer it if they just want to hear dialogue. The knee radius is how soft the compressor is. With a higher knee radius, the compression ratio gets lower, closer to the threshold. I've set this at about one decibel. The makeup gain increases the overall volume of the audio. The main purpose of this is to compensate for the reduction in volume that the compressor causes. This is the setting that makes your quiet dialogue louder. It's basically the same thing as cranking up the volume on your video player. I wouldn't recommend turning, turning this up by much, maybe 6 decibels at the most. Of course, this depends on your circumstances and whether you live in a noisy environment or not. I tested this out a little bit and it seems like with the previous settings the audio was peaking a little bit. So it turns out that with a makeup gain of about 3 decibels you probably want to reduce the threshold to something like minus 20 decibels. And then if you decide to double the makeup gain to 6 decibels you need to increase the ratio accordingly to about 4 decibels. And that way that doesn't result in any peaking. I'm no sound expert but to me if you want to avoid peaking it seems like these settings are pretty optimal. Also with loud noises like like explosions and whatever you may get peaking with, uh, with a makeup gain of six decibels but three decibels and a ratio of about two to one seems to be about optimal if you want to avoid loud pops while still getting a reasonable increase in volume. So I, I would recommend these settings overall. I found some pretty interesting comments on Reddit and some other websites. Check them out if you want to try experimenting with your settings. I'd imagine that many other video players have similar functionality to VLC as well. Podplayer has its own built-in method of loudness equalization. It sounds good with videos that have low dynamic range, but it sounds pretty bad with videos that have high dynamic range, such as films. And it has pretty low customizability, 
You can find other sound normalization options in most direct show bass players, which function quite similarly to VLC's sound normalization feature. If the compressor feature in VLC doesn't work for you, you can try looking up a guide for how to use these online. Well, those are the main methods of sound normalization I've found so far, but there are a few others you may consider. Razer Surround includes volume normalization, which is an alternative to the Windows loudness equalization. Similar to the Windows method, it is system-wide and it applies to all the sound coming from your system. In my opinion, it is not needed since it is quite similar to Windows loudness equalization. However, if you have issues with Windows sound normalization, then this might actually work for you. Some sound cards and laptops include audio software that has sound normalization with it. For instance, Creative Labs has sound normalization on their sound card software. A sound card software I personally have tried in the past is Dolby HTV4, or home theater version 4, which is included with older laptops and older sound cards, such as my now broken Xona U7. The sound normalization on Dolby HTV4 is the best I've ever used. Loud sounds stay loud rather than becoming quieter, while quieter sounds get louder, and the volume difference when switching from quiet parts of a song to louder parts of a song is much less noticeable and more pleasing to listen to than any other sound normalization software I have ever used. The only issue? It was barely adjustable and sometimes the quiet sounds were too loud. Hmm. What else have I tried? Well, I did try using virtual audio cable connected to a VST volume limiter plugin. I'll include a diagram here of how I think it worked roughly. It's been a while since I've used this method. It does sound pretty good and results you get are quite similar to Dolby HTV4, with the advantage of being adjustable, but I wouldn't really recommend this method because it uses up a lot of CPU power and it has quite a fair bit of latency. A lot of paid content providers offer volume smoothing or some form of volume normalization. For instance, Spotify offers volume normalization settings in the app. There are also hardware methods of volume normalization and dynamic compression. You can find hardware with audio compressors, and some home theater setups include similar features. I personally haven't tried them, and your mileage may vary. In the future, I may make a version of this video for Mac, since I intend to get a Mac at some point for university and video editing purposes. I've done a brief look over of some Mac OS software with similar functionality on Google, and it sounds like something like Soundflower and AU Lab or Audio Hijack Pro in combination with a plugin such as Loudmax or Apple's audio unit plugins seems to work as an alternative to Windows loudness equalization. And of course, plenty of video players for Mac such as VLC Media Player support audio compression. Well, that concludes the main content of the video. I hope you found it useful. And I hope that I'll find this useful as well, as I refer to this video over the years. Apologies if the video appears a bit rushed. Uh, I wanted to upload this as a two-year anniversary to my last publicly available video on this channel on the 7th of July. I kind of left this to the last minute as I'm pretty good at procrastinating. <laughs> um, I might have missed a deadline. I was originally intending to be a bit more experimental with this video. I wanted to try out some After Effects stuff and experiment with the music, but I ran out of time, so... Hopefully my next video, which I hope to release around January next year, will be a bit higher quality. The next part of this video is a bit of a channel update. Keep watching if you want. It has been just over a year since I've last made a video on my now defunct gaming channel, and two years since my last public video on this channel. I have quite a few unlisted videos uploaded after that date, but whatever. So I guess you could say this video is my two year anniversary of not making high quality content. Now I've decided to change my content up a bit. I kind of alluded it in my previous channel announcement. I intend to shift to technology related videos as time goes on. My long term goal for making videos, the reason I'm making videos is very selfish. I want to make videos solely for myself. That is the main focus. What other people like about my videos is secondary to what the main focus is. I want to make videos because I want to, not because other people want me to. As a secondary focus, I hope that other people find my videos useful. And it's not just other people. I want the videos to be useful for me as well. You know, you know the old phrase, the best way of learning is teaching. 
Not that I want to be a teacher, but I do want to help other people by spreading useful information. Am I going to make any more meme videos? Well, I may make one or two if I want to, but they'll probably end up on my second channel. I do intend to make a big meme related video around April next year. You can probably guess what it's going to be about, but I don't know if I even have enough time or skill to actually make it. Not to mention that I have other personal projects outside of YouTube. YouTube will only be a secondary source of income for me. I don't think it'll ever become a primary source of income. To me, this is the only approach to YouTube that would avoid burnout. You see so many YouTubers pushing rigorous schedules and trying to obtain as many views as they can. And in the end, they end up burning out from stress and running out of ideas. I guess it makes sense because, well, it's a job and they need to make a living somehow, but it's not really sustainable. If any of you are planning on making YouTube videos, I think the key to doing YouTube is to do what you love. It doesn't matter what other people love because if you love what you do, then other people are bound to notice eventually. As Elon Musk said, don't worry if others do, if you do, others will.